Hi there. I thought I would talk about compositing today, uh, which is a technique for making a rendering that is actually not rendered. Um, that basically takes um, a kind of more artistic approach to uh, creating drawings for your projects. Um, and the, the basis of a composited drawing uh, is usually a series of views from uh, one of your projects. And uh, I just grabbed a uh, simple SketchUp project here. Um, I like SketchUp because there are so many potential uh, ways of viewing the model, both with uh, lines and materials, um, but also making it look sketchy or uh, a number of other um, styles that are kind of readily available in SketchUp. Um, also, I find that composing the view is much easier. This particular perspective view has a fairly wide field of view. Um, it's quite easy to uh, change that in SketchUp uh, just by typing in a number um, that you want. So anyway, I prefer that uh, even if you've created the project in another um, piece of software. Uh, a lot of this can be done in Revit, um, which is of course a favorite. Um, but uh, uh, again, the um, techniques that you use, uh, it kind of doesn't really matter um, where you get them. It's just having a number of different ones. And I'll show you what I mean. There, there's two basic uh, things that you need to consider after you've composed your perspective. And of course, the composition is a huge issue, choosing a view that really talks about your project um, in a way that shows it off to its best. Once you've got the composition, um, you basically have to consider um, what uh, sort of style or graphical uh, uh, style that you want for your image, and then what do you want to actually see in the image. And uh, what I'm going to show you here is not kind of um, a, a perfect process, but it's merely um, one way of going about things. So anyway, here is my basic view out of SketchUp, and I've got all the textures showing, and I've got some scale figures, you know, lotty, lotty, lotty. Um, no daylighting or anything. One of the things you can do, I'm just going to turn these layers off one by one. Um, I can have a view without the scale figures. And this uh, view without the scale figures gives me an opportunity to um, make changes to this uh, background, such as blurring, um, that will uh, then not be applied to the scale figures. I can also have a view without uh, textures in it. And again, sometimes this is a really nice view to experiment with. Um, you can even have a view without the uh, walls. Um, I probably should have turned off these annoying pictures, too. They don't look so so sporty here. Um, but anyway, um, or you can have a view with just the lighting. This is particularly good if you have a lighting-intensive project. You can fake the lighting in SketchUp. Uh, the lighting that's created in SketchUp, you can fake it using Photoshop techniques really pretty easily. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, I have a view with just the scale figures. Again, you can um, use these. this layer. It's very easy to crop these figures to look like they're hiding behind furniture. Um, here's a, just a line view out of SketchUp, no textures. Um, uh, and in fact, the, the uh, edge lines here are fairly straightforward. Um, they don't have a lot of line weight to them. Uh, this is an x-ray view. Uh, again, SketchUp, Revit, any modeling program really, um, uh, or BIM program, will, will probably have the ability to do these different views. And in fact, um, you can even blend these views uh, in um, something like Revit with the advanced graphical controls. So anyway, uh, SketchUp has these styles um, that are lots of fun. Um, this is one of the style uh, builder contest winder, winners here. Very fun. And, you know, here's a, a sketchy line view. Um, uh, and, and, you know, again, that's a, just a fun way to view your project. And then here's a, a white on black, which is also um, a fun way to view your project. Um, let me turn this one on and uh, start by showing you a, a couple of techniques here. One of the simplest uh, techniques, um, I'll take this uh, composited view here uh, that just has the materials and leave the, the scale figures out of it for the moment. Uh, one of the simplest things you can do is uh, really just selective deletion. Um, you can take this original layer and um, I'm going to make a copy of the uh, layer, uh, just choose Duplicate, just so I don't mess up the original. Um, and of course, I can't read my names here. There we go, copy. Turn off the original. Um, and what you can do is you can actually just kind of select 
part of the uh, view and delete it. And you get this really interesting um, effect where the uh, black and white contrasts with the color. Now, um, you might say, well, that's all fine and dandy, but I'd like something a little softer. Maybe uh, the center is in color and the um, perimeter is uh, actually not, uh, uh, it's just lines. So you can uh, right click on your selection and choose Select Inverse and then delete that. Um, but what looks even nicer is um, if you, uh, let me select my inverse again, if you feather this selection, um, feathering allows you to kind of soften the edge. Now the amount that you feather here, 200 is in, uh, described in pixels. Um, the uh, radius uh, varies depending on the resolution of the drawing. So uh, 250, I know this is a pretty high resolution image. Um, I've got about 4,000 pixels, which is good for printing at about 20 inches. So, you know, uh, I, I would adjust this if it was a smaller resolution. Anyway, what you see is, is more of a, I don't know, potato shape. And uh, again, I'm gonna select the inverse and delete. And now when you look at it, see how it has a softer fade. And uh, this actually looks really nice on boards, um, but absolutely you could um, uh, change the amount of feathering or the shape, um, or you can even choose something else to feather. Um, or just a partial feather. Anyway, and once you have uh, something like this, you can choose to add back in elements. So for example, I have feathered it to get this soft look, but I can add back in the furniture, and it just kind of gives a sharpness to the furniture, which is, which is uh, kind of appealing. Um, you can also, uh, that furniture layer, if you uh, don't like it quite so sharp, you can fade it out. Um, to get more or less of the feathering. Again, you're, you're composing um, using kind of your artist brain and not your I want to represent everything brain. Finally, uh, you can add back in the scale figures. Now, uh, scale figures are um, a little tricky um, because they are um, white. So you have to decide which layer they want to be on top of. Remember, layers in Photoshop are opaque. Um, you could come in and change the blending mode. Uh, multiply uh, is a great blending mode um, for certain things because uh, what it does is anything that's white becomes transparent and anything that's black becomes solid um, and opaque. Um, and then anything that's gray uh, is adjusted, its opacity is adjusted based on its uh, density. Um, however, in this situation, I want those scale figures to shine through, so multiply isn't going to work so well. Go back to normal. So instead, I can use my um, magic wand tool. Make sure that contiguous is selected, and I usually uncheck this sample all layers. I know nothing is visible, but you have to be careful. If contiguous is not selected, it will select anything inside here that's white. It'll basically select any pixel that's white on my screen. Um, contiguous means it looks for a, a boundary around whatever I click on. So when I click on that, it'll find the edges here. Of course, I need to get these little uh, elements in here, the armpits. Um, and then all I have to do is delete. And there you go. You have scale figures. An alternative to this, by the way, um, I could uh, select the inverse here. Oops, go back to my uh, selection command. Select the inverse. So now I just have the people selected. And I could create a new layer. Uh, I'll create it via copy. And again, this is just a technique. Sometimes um, you, this look is a little better than uh, the other uh, option. Always make sure, by the way, when you do these things that you check the anti-alias button if it is available. Um, that will give you a smoother effect. Anyway, uh, if I have this layer selected, I can come in and say delete the part of this body that should be behind the door. And I can come in, I'll just use a selection box here, and delete this person, a little surgery, and there you go. So. Doing it in this way, I'll turn off the uh, furniture, make it a little more dramatic. You can create a very interesting um, effect 
Or I could even come in if I decide I want these figures to be um, something else. I could paint them um, maybe black, Oop, except my foreground color is white. So we'll choose here, we'll paint them dark red. Oh yeah, like that look. And again, it's look, you're trying to compose a view that has some drama and interest to it. You know, maybe there's something boring going on in the foreground here. You cover it up with an interesting scale figure. The big thing is um, make it look interesting. Scale figures, by the way, typically you'll have one in the background, middle ground, and foreground. And this just helps to read the depth of the drawing. Anyway, all these techniques can be uh, used with um, uh, any of these layers, so I just happen to be using the sketchy line layer. Now, uh, other fun things that you can do, here, let me turn this layer back on, um, that, uh, and I'll turn off these other layers, um, is uh, you can apply filters to these background layers. Uh, maybe I'll use the layer without the people on it. Um, and again, I would strongly recommend making a duplicate of the original layer that you're planning to fiddle around with um, so that as you uh, experiment, you can uh, uh, sort of go and run and run back to the original image if need be. Anyway, um, these filters are really a great um, uh, sort of effect that you can create. I'm going to go to the filter gallery here. And there's so many different filters. Some of them are, uh, as you can imagine, very artistic. Sometimes it's just nice to add um, a little bit of texture to a drawing um, to kind of soften it. SketchUp drawings in particular, the stuff that you get out of SketchUp is a little, um, I don't know, harsh. So you can add all sorts of um, uh, features. And uh, each of these artistic effects have um, sliders that you can change. And of course, there's a preview, which you can pan around in and see the effect um, to it. I'll add a little more grain here. Um, and you can see that it will be um, uh, basically a little dotty. Click OK. It applies the filter, and you might say, well, you know, that's not so exciting. I don't like that image. Um, but maybe you only... Uh, use it at a lower opacity. When you print this, it'll give it just a tiny bit of texture, um, and uh, that can be nice. Another technique is to make this layer a black and white layer, and that will also give it some texture. To make a black and white layer, we need to jump down here to uh, the adjustment layers option. There's a million different ones, um, but the black and white layer is a good one. I'll stick the black and white layer in here. And what it does is it converts everything below it in the stack to black and white. So even this uh, uh, original view is black and white. I want to just glue this black and white layer to my weird photoshopped filtered layer. To do that, um, hold down the uh, Option key on a Mac or Alt on a PC and click in between the two layers. What that does is it creates um, a link between the two layers. It's indicated by this little down arrow. Now, layers below this in the stack are unaffected. Um, and this allows you to take this adjusted layer and fiddle around with it, fiddle around with the opacity, uh, or even the blending modes. They don't always work um, so well, but now when I do this, it um, applies just the texture um, without um, the white area. If you want to uh, make uh, this layer composition permanent, you can also um, merge these layers. In fact, you can flatten the entire image um, if you are planning to kind of do a Photoshop-y filter to the entire image, um, or you can just merge the selected layers. Um, and then they become one. This one layer, now there's no going back. I can't undo that filter, which is why I made the copy. Um, but the blending modes often work a little better when you do it this way. Anyway, that is, uh, again, another feature that you can do where you can use your selective uh, deletion to um, accentuate the effect. Uh, anyway, that's a great um, technique. Um, other techniques uh, that you can use sometimes when you are, uh, and so I would strongly recommend, by the way, trying a number of these different filters. Um, they are really terrific. I usually go straight to the filter gallery um, and uh, can try different ones. 
um, just by looking at them and then I don't have to apply them if I decide I don't like it. Um, a lot of these are great for texture in your image. A lot of times your materials look very flat, particularly in a non-rendered rendering. Um, and you can go online and you can download things. You can even use some of these very aggressive filters like stained glass, um, which can be great if you're actually trying to create stained glass, but also as a blended layer below. Anyway, one of the last uh, things that I'd like to show you is a technique for uh, creating uh, textures on different surfaces um, when uh, your original rendering or the textures you created in the program are just not really what you're hoping for. So for example, if I wanted to add a texture to a back wall, for example, um, I can use my magic wand and um, click on the back wall. I'm using a black and white layer here, by the way, to create a selection. Um, I could also just draw a selection box, uh, which maybe is probably a little easier. Um, and uh, when I create a box like that, and maybe I come in and, uh, let me see, I'll uh, remove uh, parts of this wall. Ah, whatever, I'll just use the magic wand. Can never decide the best way to select walls. Um, what you can do is you can create a layer that is um, a texture uh, layer. Uh, thank you, Sydney, for this one. Um, in this case, I'm going to choose a pattern. And uh, let's say I want to have this, what is this? I don't know what this is. It's like some kind of alligator skin or something. Um, I can fill this uh, selection with a pattern. You see how the preview here indicates that I had an area selected. Um, and this is a great way to um, just fill a flat section of wall. And in fact, you can scale the texture or even change your mind. And this is a really uh, fun way to work with a client. Um, if you uh, are so inclined, um, obviously a client uh, are going to have uh, want want some options for their layer. Anyway, once you click OK, um, it creates the texture, and you can come back in and edit that later on, change the scale of it, even change the texture, um, and uh, of course blending modes and opacity and all that are available. Now, uh, what if you want to paint on this side wall? Well, oh, whoops. Um, Go back to this layer. Um, I'm going to select this sidewall, and there's a couple of different ways um, that you can approach this. But usually, the big problem uh, with these sidewalls is that they're in perspective. And if even if I wanted to use the same pattern, I'm going to run into a little trouble. So what I usually do, I create a new layer here, and on this new layer, I'm going to select all, and I'm going to paint using. Uh, maybe I'll just use that same pattern that we're using in the other one, just for the fun of it. And I'm gonna paint, whoops, the entire, uh, just turn that layer off, the entire uh, surface here uh, with that material. Um, and I could also uh, create a new layer that's a texture layer and um, uh, do it the way I did before. Um, but the reason I'm doing this, let me go back to my previous uh, view here. Uh, I am going to uh, reselect that uh, wall, come on, oh, except I'm on the wrong layer. You gotta be on the right layer to select it. Uh, I'm gonna reselect that wall, uh, come back to this layer here. You can see this is the area that I want to paint. Um, now I can create a, a, a layer mask, which uh, is basically the same uh, idea as this previous layer. The only difference is that now I uh, can make this material go and uh, be have its perspective distortion uh, be corrected. So all I have to do, go to this material here, I'll just click on it, uh, I'm going to select all, command A, and I'll go and I'll use, um, I have to zoom out a little bit here so we can see the uh, editing tabs, and um, I can now come and uh, transform this material by clicking and dragging on uh, the material. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here so you can see what happened. As I drag this, see how it stretches the material? And in fact, I can use any of the transform operations. In this case, I want it to look like it's in perspective. So I'll choose perspective distortion. And now, look at this, I can even make it match the vanishing points in my space Obviously, this material is more of a pattern, but anything that has linear elements to it, you're going to want to match the perspective in your project. 
me just accept these changes here, zoom in a little bit, and what you'll see is that the material gets denser as you get farther away, and of course, as you get into the foreground, it gets um, more open. This is exactly what you want. Um, anyway, and then of course, this is a layer like any other layer. You can turn it on and off, um, and you can change its opacity. In fact, it'd be nice to even match it with that side wall or the back wall if possible. So this is one last technique that really is um, a, a handy one um, for uh, creating um, a texture that looks like it's in perspective. Now, uh, sometimes you uh, want to make the lighting a little more dramatic. Um, uh, Photoshop does have a lighting filter. Now, it's not a true kind of 3D architectural um, uh, uh, modeler here. Uh, uh, Photoshop does not know uh, in 3D space where things are, although there is definitely a 3D option in Photoshop, and uh, you can kind of do some 3D modeling. I think if you're going to do 3D modeling, you're probably going to do it in SketchUp or Revit. Um, but uh, if you just want to fake something in real quick, um, these lighting effects are really great. I'm just going to go to the lighting effects uh, layer, and what you'll see is that there are these different kinds of light bulbs that you can use. I'm using a spotlight. There are also point lights, um, which are general uh, lights, and an infinite light, which is kind of just, I don't know, it goes on forever, I suppose. Um, anyway, each of these lights can be moved and manipulated in different ways. And uh, like other filters, they only work um, on the uh, uh, selected area. I'm going to drag this light over. You can create um, standard uh, uh, compositions here. There's a, a number of different ones, including three down lights or five down lights. Um, which are kind of more architectural. Um, and each of these has a number of features. For example, you can change how intense the light source is. You can also choose if there's a hot spot or not. See, it uh, expands the inner circle. Um, you can change some of these things graphically as well. Um, you can make it colorful. You can make it appear glossy or metallic. Um, the big one for us is the ambience. If you drag this slider up, it will wash out the less rest of the wall more as I drag it over, or less if you want a super dramatic uh, lighting effect. Um, this can be super dramatic. Typically for us, you don't want to wash out the materials too much. Anyway, when you've got it the way you want, click OK. And now you've got a lighting effect applied to this wall. It is by no means uh, three-dimensional, but um, it is quite effective at rendering materials. Anyway, as you do all these different layers, um, and blend them, you can uh, kind of have an infinite uh, number of ways of composing this drawing. Uh, let's see, I forget which one I liked the best here. Probably this one. Um, maybe not with that stuff, though. Um, and uh, once you've created the drawing that um, you like the best, um, that is, that's it. You're done. You uh, export this image. Um, save it into a file format that um, you can put on your boards. Uh, just one last word here. When you have created this image, um, make sure that you check the image size. Uh, now, I know that I uh, exported these guys as, I believe, about 4,000 pixels. Every piece of software exports um, pixels uh, at a different resolution. The resolution is the pixels per inch. So um, typically your printer is going to be is going to want to be at 200 pixels per inch. Um, basically, a good idea before you go, especially into InDesign. InDesign really just cares about the inches. Um, we care uh, about resolution because we're going to be printing. So if we type in 200 pixels per inch, make sure you don't resample that uh, image. This will tell you how big your drawing can print before it starts to look pixelated. Of course, pixelation is the enemy of good quality printing. Um, make sure you change this image size last um, before you go to insert it into InDesign. That way, when you go to InDesign and you just click the image into uh, your layout, um, it'll be the best size for printing. Okay, and this is true of still images or of, uh, this is obviously a Photoshop uh, document. And there you go.